Hey there. This is Sarah. It's Brian. Hey. Wow. And we're here doing the Pixel Pushers podcast thing. Yeah. Without Where can pickles. you find us? Oh, you can find us now in all places that podcasts are grown and launched. Um, Spotify, Google Play Store, soon on the iTunes Store, and, you know, all those kind of places. All those. And on our website. But uh, today we are going uh, across the country again to Broomfield, Colorado, up mile high, right outside of Denver. And we're talking to... Jeremy Moore. He just received his doctorate in education with majors in innovational leadership. And he is a doctor of education at the University of Colorado. And he's going to talk to us about college. Yeah, college life or lack of. During COVID-19, yep. talk about those campus parties, you know, all that <laughs> stuff. We're kind of wondering, how is college working during this whole thing? And coming out of it, as everything is reopening, how is it going to work? Um, why don't you go ahead and push us into the uh, conversation? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, doctor, that feels weird, Dr. Jeremy Moore, uh, so yeah. J-E-R, E-M-Y, and then M-O-O-R-E, and uh, I'm here in, uh, I live right outside of Denver, so uh, um, I guess you could call it a suburb, it's kind of a suburb of both Boulder and Denver, uh, it's in Br Broomfield, Colorado, and uh, yep, we're, up, we're, we're there at the Mile High, um, and uh, I also work at the University of Colorado Boulder as well, um, and I work in a... What, what was that? Uh, I was going to say, and you built a house there, and it looks, the, the house you built looks pretty familiar on the screen. So, oh, yeah, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. this house before. <laughs> this is my actual house. I've got the carrot, uh, the carrot uh, drapes back there. and uh, <laughs> The carrot yeah, drapes. Very, yeah, very colorful when I wake up. <laughs> yeah, I, I like your color scheme. Yep, yep. So, what's it, um. What's it like? What's it been like? I mean, where what, what is it? Wait, what is your doctrine in? What is? What oh yeah, in? yeah. Sorry, you did ask that. So, okay. uh, doctor of education, um, and uh, my sp uh, specific track I was studying was innovation and leadership. So, um, oh, awesome. looking, yeah, looking at um, how our systems, like our education systems, really like change leadership. Um, we don't change. I like to say we. I like to laugh and say we don't really change a lot in higher ed. Uh, so that's why I, I pursued a doctorate in higher ed leadership. But. Uh, <laughs> Cool. Yeah, no, we change a lot all the time, uh, constantly, especially with what's going on right now. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet that's a challenge. <laughs> sometimes that's like a forced change or, you know, um, I mean, sometimes you just have to, but I think people evolve anyways, you know, with their mindsets and how they think. So that's, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting uh, field you're going into there. Yeah, yeah, no, I think just like you said, it's uh, it's that force change a little bit. I think I think it's uh, disruption is the word that we like to use a lot now, the buzzword. Um, and I think for a business enterprise like higher ed, you know, when you have something like COVID nineteen, uh, it this changes our it changes the nature of what we're doing dramatically. Um, particularly for an institution like mine, where it's much more residential. Um, what I mean by that is a lot of our students come and they they plan on living on campus and then they live on campus for a year and then they'll move off into the community, but a lot of our students come to a university like CU, which we're the flagship for the state. Um, a lot of them will come to the university and they will expect, you know, to have, be part of a student orgs or fraternity sorority or, you know, that, that campus life. And so this is really disrupted. I think for our fall enrollment, a lot of students are saying, well, if I'm just going to be taking classes online, what does that look like for my experience? And um, my doctorate was actually completely online through Arizona State. So I, I felt like you know, when I chose to do an online program, it was very strategic because I felt like a lot of our programs and delivery of programs was going to be moving a lot more online. And I think a lot of institutions like the University of Phoenix or whatever, they get criticized for that online delivery, but uh -huh, they it's much and much more of a legitimate operation um, because schools can save money, but you can still get the same quality of instruction. Now, some people might argue with me on the quality of instruction part, but I truly feel like you can get, I, I mean, I had classes with the same faculty that taught in the in-person program. Um, and for me, I actually, my classmates were global. So I have classmates from Singapore, uh, Mexico, um, all over the United States. Um, so I benefited from their 
from basically their experiences because I got experiences that might, I wouldn't have gotten in an in-person setting. So you don't actually have to have that separate foreign exchange thing. You already yeah, have. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's you know, awesome. Um, like back in, uh, back in the 90s and like even early 2000s, I remember University of Phoenix because uh, they were starting to do their online thing and they mm -hmm. were kind of ahead of the curve on it. But people were just like, whoa, online. We, yep. you know, there were businesses at that time that couldn't even figure out that they needed a website. Yep. Um, and they're actually, you know, like they're actually doing such a good job. Um, like if you homeschool a child, um, you used to have to just get all the books and like do the curriculum. Now you got you uh, a company called meetings. K through 12. Yeah. And I've seen people homeschool. It's like, they're not, it's just like going to school, but at the computer and, then you go have your the kids go and have their like get togethers at the 4-H club or whatever. They're very limited though, because I, I did that for a year with my son and four years for my daughter. Well, yep. your kids yep. are older. More recently, I am was just blown away by how mm -hmm. I mean our technology has improved so much, and that is probably going to be what people do from here on out. But what you mentioned I thought was interesting uh, was campus life. Like that's a big yep. part of college that people. Oh, I got with college. You got the, uh, you know, the fraternities, the sororities, yeah. the campus life, the, you know, uh, keg stands. <laughs> like, are you, are you, are you, are you doing that on Zoom or, you know? Like... Well, I think you know. It's funny you ask that. football on Zoom. <laughs> that's real. I mean, that's really what a lot of the work we've been doing the last couple months has been um, with really shifting to COVID. I mean, so we started working remote probably the the middle of March. So I've been working remote now for almost about two months and. It was pretty sudden. I mean, I I remember going into the office. I remember I remember us working in the office the beginning of March, and that's when really a lot of the COVID stuff really started coming out pretty quickly. And I remember we said, I think it was the end of the second week of March, my boss said, we're going to probably start doing a skeleton schedule just to minimize the amount of people in the office. And so I was the first person to take the first schedule on the following Monday. I was the only full-time staff member in the office. We had our students there too. We had two people come in our office that day and I take the bus to work most days. I'll walk to the bus stop and take the bus. And I even remember getting on the bus. I was like, is this really the best idea right now? Like I wasn't, I wasn't fearful like that I was going to get COVID from the bus or anything. But at that point, cause I know that they are sanitizing everything really well. But I think the bigger issue is, is like, you have to think about your points of exposure. So I'm like, okay, I'm getting on the bus, you know, and there wasn't anyone really on the bus at that point. People were already starting to just work from home or, or drive themselves. I got onto campus and, you know, we've got 35,000 students on campus, but there wasn't 35 students at that moment. It's kind of like a ghost town. And I went into my office and I remember thinking, we're going to probably be working remote, but they hadn't made a decision. And I went home that night. And then the very next day they said, we're working remote. So I didn't even have any of my stuff for work. So I had to go back a couple weeks later and grab all my stuff. Um, and uh, I've been set up at home ever since. Um, and, and, you know, I'm fortunate that I'm able to work from home. I think the hard part is for our operation, you know, we've got dining staff, we've got environmental services staff that are cleaning the residence halls and stuff. A lot of these folks, they can't all work from home. Their jobs, some of them have to be done in person. They're essential staff. So um, I think the university has really been trying to work hard to figure out who can work from home and who cannot. And then for those who cannot, they've been trying to do administrative pay um, to help equalize the experience a little bit because people still need paychecks. We still have bills to pay. People have mortgages. They have kids. You know, they've got food they've got to buy. Um, and we have the stimulus, you know, um, the, the CARES Act and everything and all of that. But that only goes so far, you know. Um, yeah, that's not like even a month's rent, yes. you know. <laughs> I hear a lot of people are using it on just to pay for food. Mine all went to a brake job on my car. So, yeah, it was that, you know. Yeah. Mine all... <laughs> Mine all went to uh, our business, the equipment we needed to meet up to COVID-19 standards. So <laughs> that's which is kind of right. interesting. Um, so, I mean, so what is Colorado like? I mean, every place we talk to, like everybody's kind of like in their own little world and like they know what's around them because they can't get out and do it. And it's all different yep. everywhere. So mm -hmm. what is just the state of Colorado? What's, what's your environment like as far as the COVID thing? Yeah, yeah. So I think that, um, you know, we're, it's interesting because we're kind of in the, the, I don't know how people would describe Colorado. You know, I, since I'm from Ohio, a lot of times people will say, that's not the Midwest. And so I don't know if I would consider Colorado to be the heartland. I don't really know the Western states. I don't know what we would call ourselves, but physically located, we're kind of in the middle of the country. So I think in some ways we were <coughs> insulated a little bit because, you know, the coast got hit really hard, like Seattle, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, the whole, the whole West Coast and then the East Coast got hit pretty hard. Ironically, I actually was at a conference in Seattle um, the, probably the first week of February. And now we're starting to hear that, you know, COVID was probably more widespread than we thought, even at that point. Right. And that I remember sitting in the airport in Seattle, and I actually was pretty sick when I went on that trip. Um, I don't think I had, I didn't have the symptoms or anything of COVID related things. I think I just had a really, really gnarly seasonal um, allergy kind of um, flare up. But um, I remember sitting there and I was just like, gosh, I feel like crap. And I remember looking at the newscast coming in about some of the COVID stuff in um, other parts of the country. And this is when it was really just starting to hit the news and thinking, oh, that's interesting. I wonder how long this is going to last. And I think a lot of us were like that. We're like, oh, this is going to come it in passed. and it'll be like SARS was or, you know. No one knew, know. you know, and we've had like, you know, that annual like, oh, it's a uh, swine flu. Or, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Like, I thought that too. Oh, it's just anthrax again. And it'll exactly. Pass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Those kind of things. And so I remember coming home and I was like, okay, well, yeah, that's interesting. And didn't really think much about it. And then we started talking about it more at work, but it was more from like a, this might impact our international enrollment. You know, this might impact our, um, you know, some things like supply chain things, but you know, it's probably not going to be a big thing. And I remember one day I went on to order. Um, I, I do a lot of the ordering for the office. I remember I went on one day to order, I think it was hand sanitizer. Just, we just needed to re up just, you know, before everything really hit. And I remember they were like out of stock of everything, like white, wet wipes, hand sanitizer, all the medical nice gear. And I was like, hmm, that's really interesting. And this is like when things really started to spin up kind of late February. And I was like, hmm. And then I remember like a couple days later, that's when we started to hear about the first cases here in the state. And um, it, it moved pretty quickly. I remember the state set up a website really quickly. I remember it being five people or something like that. And um, it just like started growing really quickly. Our governor, I think, mobilized pretty quickly um, to to try to kind of put some things in place. But um, I, I think the hard part was like, he was kind of getting a lot of, he was getting a lot of flack from, you know, other people saying, oh, you're overreaching because we started the stay at home order um, here pretty, pretty early. And um, like some other states, and I think a lot, there's people here, definitely like any state that are like, that, that's my liberty to go where I want and do what I want, right. you know, right to bear arms, all that stuff. And um, we did have some protests at the, uh, at the Capitol, but I think here in Colorado, the thing that I appreciate is people are pretty good about expressing their voice, but I, we didn't have any, as far as I know, violent kind of behavior or anything like that. There wasn't any um, physical altercations. Um, just people kind of just expressing their right, which they're, they're entitled to express their right. Um, it was very interesting because I think there was a famous photo. I don't know if you've all seen it, but there was a couple of nurses that were actually in their full scrubs. Yeah. And when there was the, the trucks and stuff that were doing like a parade to basically go to the Capitol, these nurses actually got out in the middle of traffic and stopped in front of. And these are now people. iconic photos. Yeah. Yeah. You know, photographer. These have been like noted as being very iconic photos and probably you'll look back in like 30, 40 years and mm -hmm. see those photos. Like oh yeah. The, salute photo. yeah. the yeah. guy with his hands crossed. Yeah. I think that those are really a telling, a telling uh, moment in time, a snapshot in time of, of this whole thing. And it gets you to think about that. It's like, okay, these people are literally risking their lives every day to take care of people. And then we've got these people that are going out and, you know, protesting. And then we've got these nurses that are still taking their time to say, Hey, this isn't okay. Um, but after the stay at home uh, went into effect, you know, we started working remotely pretty quickly. A lot of elementary schools and stuff started closing down. And I have a colleague who just joined uh, the Boulder school district. And I remember talking to her uh, one day and I said, Oh, are you all going to go remote? And she said, yeah, just for like, we're going to shut down for like two weeks and then we'll be back in operation. Cause they didn't have with K-12, they don't really have an easy way to pivot as quickly to online. When you've got students that are, you know, kids that are, you know, under the age of 12, it's much harder for them to engage in online coursework. Even though a lot of our students today, young youngsters are pretty adept to that kind of thing. Um, it's just much harder for the, for the teachers, I think, to deliver it's also, okay. Yeah, it's also much harder for the parents, I think, yeah. because um, especially like if you're getting into the Midwest, Kentucky, some of the hills of Kentucky, or just even in Ohio, you still have a lot of people living in the middle of nowhere without oh, internet yeah. or very bad internet, you know, uh -huh. like doing a Zoom meeting on some of this internet out in some of these places is not possible, you know. You oh, no, no. Yeah. Or they don't have the knowledge. That there's a lot of... Um you know, not so tech savvy folks here. True. And that's, that's not anything against them at all that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. 
And it's the same here. And I think a lot of the school districts literally had hotspots that they were releasing out and they have Chromebooks that they were releasing out. And so there was like a lot of pictures and things on Facebook of these um, points of deployment where they were giving out these, all this stuff. And, um, you know, this area, a lot of people see it as very uh, more of an affluent area. We've got a lot of like um, tech industry kind of startups and things here um, and a lot of aerospace industries and stuff like that. But we still have a lot of folks that are on the lower side of the socioeconomic scale. And so um, I think that's the hard part is like you have to get all those resources for people to be able to to do classwork and stuff on, and even for our, our college students. I mean, there's a lot of students that I work with and, and we've been supporting that don't have money for food, that don't have money to pay their rent um, because they've lost their jobs too, right. because they were working at a restaurant or in a grocery store or something. And it's or as a photographer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or create. Yeah. I have a lot, like I said, at the beginning of this, I have a lot of colleagues and students and things that are creatives and uh, yeah, their industry depends on that, level of work and we're a huge tourism industry here in Colorado so like a lot of weddings have been canceled oh yes um and the national park that's when I really think I knew like this is getting serious when the national park closed down because we had people making runs for the national parks and the state parks because Colorado people like to enjoy the outdoors that's one of the reasons people live here and even now I would say one of the biggest challenges has been a lot of our trails have been overwhelmed because people are trapped in their houses all day and then on the weekends the common thing here is to go on hikes, to go on wow. these Right before I talked to you, I just went, I was like, well, you know what? Actually, I know what's happening in a lot of states. What is happening in Colorado? And I just kind of did a Google News search. Yeah. And that just came up over and over. How uh-huh. to avoid people without masks on the what, trails. So are, are there literally like people elbow to elbow on these trails? I mean, what does There's, that look like? Yeah, there's lots of people, and we've had a lot of issues with our students because that's the, the that's the type of the work uh, that we do in our office. We help with kind of the relations between neighborhoods and communities and our students, and so we've had you know um, individuals that have been concerned because they've seen people wearing fraternity or sorority letters or CU Boulder gear, and they've said they've emailed us and said you know um, we're concerned about this, and and I get it because we've had students also that have been re- hosting really large parties because it's graduation oh, time, yeah. yeah, and and that kind of thing, and we've really had to work hard to educate. Um, uh, our students about that. And unfortunately, a lot of the young people, um, our college age students are like, you know, I'm young. I'm not really that susceptible to this disease or the, not the disease, but virus. And um, well, we're hearing in a lot of places yeah. actually that we're talking oh, yeah. about. People like, yeah, definitely the younger college people are just like, yeah, it's, what did they, what did um, Katie say in Florida, they were calling it the um, boomer remover. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, boomer stuff like that. Yeah. Like, no, we're, we're totally, it can't touch us. Yeah. So. I think we're finding that not to be so true. I mean, they are yeah. more susceptible than they think. And do you have any authority um, with that? Or how do you, that must be hard to put that kind of thing in place with that. Um, because by the time you get the authority established, the parties are over. So what's yeah. that been like? The hard part is, as a university, we have to know who the individuals are. So a lot of times the neighbors, um, you know, will send us a report, which we greatly appreciate, but we don't have specific names. So it's hard for us to go and have a conversation or even follow up with those folks through our student conduct code. Um, Because we do, our conduct code applies on and off campus. So we basically, when they're part of our community, we expect them to be part of the community and part of the values that, you know, we espouse. Um, the The community at large has health ordinances. And so I think that the police department's being more um, judicious, I'll say, about trying to follow up with those things. But usually the thing is by the time they've gone to, like you said, by the time they've gone there, they'll disperse, you know, they start running, jumping over the fences, rolling under the tables, (laughs) um, all that kind of thing. And it's not just students. I want to be clear on that too. Like we've got, you know, older individuals, I see them in my neighborhood when I'm walking, you know, that are not wearing masks, that the, the part that gets me is like, you've got people that under normal circumstances would take up the whole sidewalk. You've got families of five walking all the way across and that's bad under normal circumstances because you have to go off of the path but when <laughs> like a situation like this where you're elbow to elbow and basically almost skipping down the sidewalk in arm you know each arm interlocked it's like y'all this is not a good way to go about this and you, people Ohio just forward. came out with the y'all, so. <laughs> yeah, y'all. Yeah. you got the y'all yeah but um and and i think too it's like we don't see as as many people wearing, I I don't really see a lot of people wearing masks when I go out. I am starting to see more even just within the last week or so, which is interesting. Um, And uh, I just got, I got my little mask here. I got my little mustache. (laughs) mustache So I must ask you a question. Uh, But uh, I I try to put that on and um, you know, uh, 
it's it's one of those things where you know you're going through the drive through and stuff and and I'm doing more cashless stuff I would say like when I'm going to get my coffee or whatever I'll order it in advance and just do the cashless um, kind of thing not because I'm I think it's like what what steps can I take to help protect the folks that are doing this work too like they don't need to be handling my debit card even if they have gloves on like I, I can remove that risk for them by simply just on my on my phone boop 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 you know paying for my coffee right so, or there, a lot of them are handing out the the machine with a big yeah. plastic wrap on it here and you have to yeah. do it all yourself which is fine i don't mind doing yeah the whole that. apple pay and google pay thing here uh it's still two ten years off you know? yeah Ohio, i'm so not seeing that 10 lot, years off right. on any tech yeah i'm not seeing yeah. that so, they're like i don't know what this is i don't even know my <laughs> phone doesn't work for it. yeah there's a lot yeah, of cash no. exchange still here mm -hmm. um so okay colorado is kind of just for me passing through there the handful of times i have is kind of um I guess the city, some, a lot of the cities are probably a little bit more progressive. Then you kind of get out into rancher country, which yep. is a little bit more on the other side. Right, um, right. So, like, when you get outside the city, I don't know, are you hearing, like, uh, you kind of got, like, kind of like Oregon, where I was. You kind of get, get out of the cities. You get kind of the militia kind of crazy going on there. Are you seeing any of that there? I don't know that we're seeing that, not especially not like some of the stuff we've seen with like I, I, I that guy who was in the news. Gosh, what was it like seven years ago or something? Where he had the whole um, he was like holding basically like uh, the guy that was in um, in Oregon that was like the whole militia guy. Oh I yeah, I'm yeah. back yeah. in the news again. Recently. That wasn't far. We actually just drove through that little town, and you can see why that town is a little. They just look at anybody who you don't live here. Keep keep yep. moving, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, yep. No, we haven't had a lot of that. And I have to say, like, what I've seen when I'm looking at the map, because the state updates the, the data points every single day. And I, I try not to look at it every day because I feel like it's, like it's really hard when you see the numbers go up like 700 a day or yes. whatever. Um, we are starting to slope out. And actually, the governor announced uh, two weeks ago, we're not safe, we're not safe at home or stay at home anymore. They, they were calling it safe at home. Same now here. it's safer at home. And so we're in phase two of a three. He had a nice colored little chart. He Wait, you're on like phase two of the opening. We're uh, on phase two of a reopening effort. Yeah. So that, that's actually one of my questions here. Like yeah. when it closed down, like when everything closed down in your state, what what was closed? What was considered essential? Were yeah. there weird things that you're just like, is it really? Is that essential? Uh -huh. oh, <laughs> like yeah. for, for example, like for example, um, Every state's different. Ohio, like the liquor stores were open. Pennsylvania, medical marijuana stores were open, but liquor stores were closed. So in Ohio, certain counties in Ohio, if you went to the liquor store, because you had so many people coming from Pennsylvania, you had to show ID that proved that you were from Ohio. Otherwise, you weren't allowed to buy it. Didn't yep. matter if you were old enough. You just had to be a resident of Ohio. So did you see anything like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So so actually, before the state enacted the statewide um, – uh, stay at home order uh, the some cities started to do that themselves so basically Denver proper uh, Mayor Hancock actually announced that a couple of days before Governor Polis and what happened was originally essential businesses did not include dispensaries and liquor stores people literally made runs for those and it actually caused a huge health um, concern because now people were doing exactly what we the state did not want or the city did not want them to yeah, do yeah. so very quickly um, uh, uh, Mayor Hancock said, actually, no, we're going to include dispensaries and liquor stores as essential businesses. Um, it was funny, though, because there was a press conference. Um, you could probably find this online, but there was a press conference and the mayor actually like turned and the, one of the reporters said, are you going to include dispensaries and liquor stores because people are running out there right now? And he was like, hmm, I don't know. And then he like turned to his attorney, the city attorney, and he's like, those are included, right? we'll just make those included. And then the attorney was like, actually, those are not <laughs> included in the language. So they had to like go back and I think amend it. But when um, Governor Polis was giving his, um, his or when he was putting in the stay at home order, um, he was very clear in his description and it was kind of a laughable ha ha. He was like, yeah, dispensaries are gonna be included as essential. Um, and obviously that's a big part of our industry here, right? Like that's what Colorado a lot of times is known for. It was the first, um, you know, and and Oregon was, was like pretty close behind. Yeah. Exactly. Actually, actually, the uh, COVID uh, survivor who was traveling, I was telling you about earlier before we started recording, he is a pot farmer. And yep. A big industry, employs a lot of people. And yep. So, yeah, that was um, people out here still think, I mean, I don't smoke pot, not since I was like 16. 
but people out here still look at pot as heroin or something, you know, yeah. like, which I don't, I just don't want to do it. So, right. you know, well, right. yeah, there's something to be said for the uh, shutting down the liquor store that I'm, uh, I noticed is last thing you want is the hospitals to be overrun by alcoholics in withdrawal. I mean <laughs> that, yeah. you know, heroin withdrawal won't kill you, but alcohol withdrawal can and will. And uh, that's uh, that's why I think Pennsylvania was a bit inhumane in shutting down there. <laughs> I and mean, what about that consideration? You don't want to take up those resources with something like that. I mean, you guys. So you guys are opening, and um, what's that like? Um, apparently, you're on phase two because we yep. just started. Yep. Yep. So what, One phase two. What's that and, going like? Yeah, and the thing that's interesting too about liquor and stuff, I they these businesses have gotten been able to get really creative, and the city, a lot of the cities have been really have really. Um, trying to work with the local businesses. So like here in our neighborhood, we've got a couple of local places. Like we have a, basically a keg house and we have a pizza place. And I walk through there pretty much every day at nighttime to just to get stretch my legs. And a couple of weeks after the stay at home went into effect, I started to see these banners popping up with their phone numbers really large. And it would say like, you can get your pizza. And then we also have um, beer to go wine to go you know they've got like the little bladders of beer the little the little you just pick up or you take your growler down there and they'll fill it up for you during certain hours and so a lot of these businesses got really creative curbside you know got really creative um but pretty much everything here like movie theaters were shut down um hair salons um you know uh tanning salons a lot of our state parks the national park up in rocky rocky mountain was shut down mm -hmm. um schools <clears throat> were included um, a lot of the elective, which I think elective surgery is always funny because it's like, you know, like surgery, surgery, but uh, anything that didn't wasn't life threatening, they kind of postponed um, phase two. So now that we're kind of going back into that, they're slowly reopening things like um, I actually have a haircut scheduled for Saturday just because of this whole moppy situation. <laughs> like, even the instructions that I got from my haircut place, because they started emailing a couple weeks ago. And I could tell they were hungry for business because they were saying, here's a GoFundMe for our stylists, our barbers. You know, they don't have any work right now. And um, so I wanted to support them for sure. Um, so I was really happy when I saw that the haircut. But I was also like, what's this going to look like? So you have to have your mask. Um, and when you go in, you basically check in and then they'll have you go. They're moving all the wait, waiting chairs outside or you go to your car. And then when it's your time, it's by appointment only. You, they'll basically call you in. And I think they're only doing three or four people, you know, each slot or whatever, and you'll be all over the place. And um, so it'll be interesting to see like how you cut your hair. I mean, yeah, the mask doesn't really, I'm just interested to see like around your ears and stuff. I'm assuming you'll just hold the mask or something at that point. <laughs> oh but, yeah, uh, I didn't think of that. Yeah, cause you just yeah. had, uh, she just had to deal with yeah, her uh, son who was going to a job interview yeah. and his, Hair was all kinds yeah. of crazy. And I was thinking of speakeasy kind of stuff. Right. I was thinking, haircuts. why aren't there speakeasies for this? And and I kind of <laughs> just put something out online that said, you know, my son is really neat. His haircut is anything open, hoping yep. somebody would read between the lines and say, yeah, my basement. Well, they did. They picked it up immediately. So and the guy was very busy. He it? was. He was very <laughs> busy. Uh, yeah. So we kind of snuck through uh, through on that. <laughs> Sounds like Colorado is almost identical to Ohio. Ohio, maybe the timeline yeah, surprisingly. was a little yeah. different of when things happen. Um, things are opening. I noticed our opening day for retail was actually today. I noticed yesterday a lot of places that weren't so supposed to be open yeah. were actually yeah. open. Anyway, a little day early because what's anybody going to do? Like, yeah. oh, we're going to report them. Well, it's okay now. Um, what do you think about second wave? Do you think we're going to have a second wave of this? I do. I, I mean, I do, unfortunately. And I think part of that is like, we've got people. So there was actually in Castle Rock, which is south of Denver, um, over the weekend on Mother's Day, I was reading an article just, I think yesterday, or the day before. Um, so on Sunday, there was a business that kind of defied one of the orders and opened up service for people to sit down like dining service. And so many people went there. And like, there was pictures all over the internet. Pe no one was wearing masks. None of the wait staff were wearing gloves. No, so, seen that a no, lot. Su no surprise. What happened was they actually got their uh, license revoked. Um, and, you know, the owner came out and said that she felt like the, I think, it, I think that she came out and said something to the effect that she felt like the government was overreaching and that it was her right to open her business. And she was basically hemorrhaging money. And I get that. But I also am like, this isn't how you go about doing business, you know, at this point, like, that's just going to cause a lot of problems. And I think for us preparing for the fall, like we still haven't decided as an institution, are we going to be having in person classes or online? And I just saw that the Cal State uh, schools have all decided as of today that they're all going to be remote for the whole fall semester. So 
a lot of schools are waiting. It's a wait and see um, kind of thing. And I don't know what the fall is going to look like for a lot of our operations. Um, you know, and the good thing is for higher ed, students are still going to probably go to college. But will we have some students decide to take a gap year just to wait? I, I suspect we will. And um, I couldn't blame them for that, you know, at this point, if they want that experience. And it's a lot of money to go to college these days. So, um, but the reality is, is that the job market, um, I think we're going to have a lot of people too, unfortunately, that are laid off that are going to probably also want to come back to school to get another degree or credential or something like that. that so we're probably going to see some of that happening. And it, I don't really know what the job market's going to look like. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be really interesting because I think a lot of people are saying, oh, there's going to be a lot, a lot of jobs that are going to be, people are going to be laid off. But I don't, I don't know. I think there's going to be a lot of creative businesses that are going to figure out ways to adapt and be agile and reinvent themselves. Um, I think we're already seeing some of that right now with things that are happening. Um, That's what we're doing, actually. Yeah. We're doing a lot. Oh, yeah. of, like, okay, we did a lot of events. All those events are canceled. Yes, for and year. Yeah. Possibly for more than longer than that. Mm -hmm. So you know, we're we're coming up with uh, live we streaming. A, is we have a big meeting after this about some of that. So yeah, yeah, uh, for our business, and actually, it's worked. You know, we're live streaming once a week, and uh, just why would you watch that? But honestly, every time. <laughs> Every time we do it, like we get a lead or we get something, yeah. Uh, yeah. something comes of that because, um, which kind of goes to what I was going to, you, you kind of just were touching on it. Like, I think the after whenever, you know, we're going to probably have a second wave, maybe a third, I don't know. What is the world going to look like after this? I mean, we're not shaking hands anymore where that's, I mean, is that ever going to happen? What is this world going to look like? Yeah, I think traveling, because I like to travel a lot, and I'm kind of like having that wanderlust right now of like, what, you know, where, where, what can I do? Like, the summer is always exciting. I know we talked about this, like road tripping and that kind of thing. I always look forward to that. I do think for like my colleagues, like, I think mental health is going to be a concern, because I think a lot of people are all trapped in right now. And like, I took a vacation day, I was supposed to have a vacation day today, and I took one yesterday. And it's hard to even take a couple days in a row right now, because every day is like Groundhog Day. It's like, I wake up, I eat my breakfast, I go on my computer, I sit on my computer, I go on a walk, I come home, I binge watch TV, go to sleep, repeat. And so even a vacation day right now, I've already done all the hobbies. I cleaned the grill today. Yeah. I've been baking. I mean, there's been some really positive aspects of COVID-19. I've been baking and cooking more than ever before. Um, cleaned the grill. You know, I sanded down a stool and refinished it. Like things that I, I've been on YouTube trying to figure out new skills and things. I've been telling my students this is the perfect time to, to um, hone a new t a new skill. Like for those, like I'm I'm an I'm an, a very very amateur photographer. Like so, I think like things like that, like looking at YouTube's, um, trying to figure out new you know new skills and things. This is the perfect time to be polishing up your resume, just for whatever may ne the next thing might happen. All those passion projects that have skills that you could you have time to do now. Like, yeah, yeah. Do it now you know, like we did a. Um, well, I think it was the first week and a half. We went insane. Like, we're, we don't have anything to shoot. <laughs> Everything's canceled because yeah, we're, yeah. we're a video production company. So we got a box of Esther Price cans. I saw the Esther Price chocolate. Make, make I love that. With what we have in the basement. And yeah. it turned out okay. But, I mean, got a dog trying to eat all the chocolate, which is very <laughs> bad for dogs. And, yeah. like, yes. it was it's kind of a silly little thing. I told you it started on the peanut butter allergy. Oh, yeah. She has uh -oh. a peanut butter allergy. So there's a scene where she has to bite into yeah, it. Yeah, of course it was peanut butter. Everyone. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what I've noticed, especially in the last week, I've seen some of the worst human behavior I've seen. Mm. Like, I mean, I'm not talking about the people protesting or just being anti-mask and – I've just seen people as things are reopening, people just not being nice to one another. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. What's it like there with that aspect? So I was actually going to say one of the other positive aspects I've seen of COVID-19 is actually community, uh, aspects of community. Like I've met more of my neighbors during this period of time than we were talking about this out in the alleyway the other day. You know, we were socially distanced, but like my neighbor had, our neighbors had their garage doors open and we just happened to see one another or you know, it's kind of funny because rush hour, tr rush hour traffic has actually gone from the streets to the sidewalks. And so like nine o'clock in the morning, five o'clock at the end of the day, there's people all over the sidewalks. And so I'm seeing lots of families out. I think that actually this could be a really good thing for, for the United States just for like health reasons, like people walking more, exercising. Um, and that way, 
I know I don't want to marginalize the fact that this is a horrible pandemic and we've had a lot of people die, but I think that if we can get more people outside and up off their butts and like away from the computer and the digital devices, even though we're spending more time on digital devices probably right now with Zoom and things, there's positive aspects and I think that's great. Like you said though, I think because people have been pent up, our folks in the service industry, particularly retail, um, that kind of thing, I think that that's tricky. My partner, for example, works in retail and some of the calls that I've overheard uh, from him just working here at home, like it's really interesting to see or to he- overhear sometimes when I'm getting a new fresh cup of coffee or something, some of the things that people are saying like, oh, somebody touched uh, the corner of a sofa cushion. I need to have the whole sofa returned because of COVID, you know, like that kind of thing. And it's like, it's a little probably overkill, right? Like, you right. know, uh, or or like people that are like, I've created a whole decontamination zone in my house, you know, if anybody, and, and I'm not faulting anyone or throwing any, any shade, so to speak, for anybody taking those risks for themselves. But I just read an article that popped up on my phone yesterday. This, this youngster, she's, well, as a teenager, somebody working at like a local mom and pop um, ice cream shop in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, was barraged with really angry people when they reopened and they actually, up. I read the yeah. same article. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. was like, that's ridiculous. That's like terrible. It's horrible. And, you know, so, it's funny because that's why I asked that question was because of that article. Yeah. And then I had a personal experience at a, a dollar store, just like um, two days, a mother's day, actually. And it was ridiculous. Like just the way everybody was acting. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. And I think like for people like, some people just are just not great human beings, to be honest. And I think that sometimes these situations bring out the worst in that. And people are really impatient. Um, but like when I've gone to pick food up and stuff, um, I feel like people are getting used to the routine now and tr- and are, are trying to be more patient and understanding. But it's like you can't expect you're going to get the same exact quality of service. And that doesn't have anything to do with our service industry. But like I think you have to be understanding that there's not, they're not always going to have the same things. I was at a, I was at a restaurant a couple, I think it was Chipotle or something. I was going to pick up a, an order that we had ordered in advance and somebody was mad because they had run out of, I don't know what they ran out of, but they ran out of something. And I'm like, well, the supply chain is all over the place right now. Like you just kind of have to but, be, but I'm used point. to having what I want. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, people understand. Um, I've done some food delivery service to, to try to make up some of the income that we've lost. Yeah. And I've, learned very quickly that they don't have the staff to keep up with the demand for the food delivery. So the food isn't going to be ready on time. I mean, that's just the way it is. And so many people are getting, and people don't understand it. They don't know that. (laughs) And a lot of rules are being broken so that they can keep up with the, with the food demand. It's very scary. And it's Chipotle that that I'm talking about too. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you just mentioned was like people being outside. Now I've noticed that in Dayton, Ohio. Now if, you know anything about Dayton, Ohio, people don't go outside. They get in their pickup trucks and they, they yell things out their window. And then they, that, what, there's someone walking? What's wrong with them? Um, but I've noticed a lot of people out. I saw this really funny meme that I just got to bring up. And it was uh, 6 o'clock uh, before COVID. And it's a whole family with all these kids. And they're all on their different devices. And then 6 p.m., during covid lockdown they're all outside having fun yep <laughs> yep, yep. it's like getting exercise not you know like it's almost kind of reset america like back i don't know to a time even before i was born you know like i don't think even when i was growing up yeah i think we roamed the streets a little bit more but mm-hmm. but i don't think even when i was growing up like it wasn't well and you know and we we grew up in kind of similar similar just down the road from one another so like we had we lived in those kind of cul-de-sac communities where you could just kind of roam around the houses were like right next to one another but it's kind of one of those things where that's kind of not been the case for a lot of people in the last like two decades or so um, where their kids just wander around as much as we probably did when we were kids. I mean, they but, wander around the internet. And yeah, that's- yeah, 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 so. yeah no, exactly, exactly. And I think it's been interesting to rediscover things, you know, and I think that it's been a good thing to see people out and about. Um, and like I said, I think that this could be a really great thing. And I think if we take away some of the health practices, like washing your hands regularly, walking more regularly, getting up, um, those kind of things. I've been trying to have as many standing meetings as I can. I'll be like, hey, instead of Zooming, can we? Can I call you on the phone and put my AirPod in or whatever and walk around the neighborhood with a dog or something? And 
that's been good. I've also found a lot of the meetings I had, like, do we need to have all these meetings? Some of them aren't. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Anymore. It's like, this was not. A I was like, please don't make any PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I think there's been some positives. Unfortunately, we've seen some negative sides of, of humanity out there. Um, and, and people get scared, and I think they tend to um, to pull within and get really selfish and stuff. But I, I have been watching The Walking Dead since the beginning, and I feel like this is not The Walking Dead. We don't have people like <laughs> militias out there, you know, taking over places. And the doomsday preppers, I remember when this all started, they were interviewing these people who have like the doomsday prepper bunkers and stuff and the people who build them. They're like, yeah, business is going to be through the roof. And I'm like, eh, you know, like – it's one of those things. I think, you know, we've, we've been lucky. We haven't been hit with a pandemic like this in a really long time. And I suspect Go there'll ahead. be another. It, it, don't you think like, like for the like, doomsday preppers, like they, they were ready for the cold war. They were ready for missile attacks. They're ready for this, that and upper risings. I don't think anybody really thought a germ would yeah. be the thing. You know, you yeah. can't, you're not going to take your gun and go shoot the germ, you know? <laughs> like, no. no, you're not. You're not, but there's people who think you can. There's people who definitely think a bullet's going to kill a, kill a germ, you know, and, no. and that kind of thing. And it's 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 really interesting to think about that. But it's really showed weakness in our society about how um, well it showed how in interesting how like I mean like the bus system and stuff like all these things are so dependent on. Um, and we're, we're very much an individual, individualistic, uh, sorry, individual, that is not the word I cannot say, individualistic. individualistic, there we, individualistic society, there we go, I finally got it, uh, we're so much a, a type of society that, um, something like this really is interesting, and even wearing masks, like, we're very feisty against that, um, you know, not wearing that, and it's such a, such a norm in places, you know, over in, like, Japan and stuff, um, it's yeah. been really interesting to see, how we've adapted, try had to have adapted to something like this. And um, yeah. So Places gonna... with smaller epidemics, um, like you said, Japan, you, you notice a lot more people are wearing masks. Even though that epidemic was over before this pandemic, you will see a lot more people wearing masks and it kind of came the norm and like, you don't have someone going up and wanting to shoot people about it. So <laughs> Um, no, you don't. But I think the other thing is, is like, there's, there's definitely colleagues and friends of mine and other people I've seen on, in, on the internet, like, there's definitely different types of people that are being impacted very um, disproportionately with COVID. So like, um, individuals of color and things that marginalized groups, like putting on a mask for those types of groups or people can definitely be very different because of just like some of the things that have happened with the police and some of the police brutality. So like, and unfortunately the situation that happened just last week with the, um, the runner um, okay. and in the community um, and that kind of thing. And I think there, so these things impact people very differently. And so it's, it's interesting um, when people do make judgment about others and why they're doing something or why they're not doing something, we have to remember that we're all different, you know, our identities and things are different and it impacts people very differently. All right, so that was Jeremy, University of Colorado, Doctor of Education at University of Colorado, right outside of Denver. Uh, pretty interesting conversation. Oh, yes. Like, a lot of things I didn't even consider, you know. I mean, we're getting older, and college is kind of the furthest thing from our mind. Except for those student loans. <laughs> those are pretty, uh, yeah. Lifelong. And, um, well, tune in next time when we will have something for you, and we'll tell you about that when we figure it out. <laughs> Yeah. In the meantime, <laughs> visit us on WeDoVids.com, SarahBennettPhotography.net, and we are found where all podcasts are grown with good soil. That would be Spotify, Google Play Store, and where are the cheese sticks? Apple iTunes. So. Cheese sticks at Apple iTunes? Anyways, see you next time.